now. Detonate the reality bomb! I will build a great, great wall. Some alien race to come down and threaten us. Is the singularity near? The truth is out there. The military industrial complex. The seven mountains of the influencers of culture. To be as gods, you know. Change has come to America. Catapult the propaganda. From a secure location on top of the ridge in the heart of the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. We've got the windows open tonight. Warm weather and the coyotes howling in the holler down below the ridge. That means it's time for a view from the Bunker Live for January 6th of 2019. I'm Derek Gilbert. Tonight we'll talk about the government shutdown entering its third week. The political posturing with the new congressional dog and pony show. It's going to be a long two years. An American institution ready to close its doors and Snopes debunks the world's number one cause of death. That in our interview segment tonight. Satanic panic was fake news. Dr. Gregory Reed of Youth Fire Ministries joins us tonight. Settle in, grab a cup of coffee, and get ready. It's a view from the bunker, live. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Derek Gilbert. Listening in tonight, wherever you are, uh, we appreciate you letting us into your ears uh, via Spreaker.com, iHeartRadio, Stitcher.com, Spotify.com, and of course, if you're listening at the website, VFTB.net, we appreciate that as well. If you're not listening live, you can listen in the archives. Time shift us to when it's convenient for you. Subscribe to the podcast. You can do that a number of ways. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and we've got links to all of those places to log in, to sign up and subscribe. Download the MP3s direct to your smartphone, tablet, or wherever you listen. Uh, You'll get all of those at the website, vftb.net. Of course, you can play directly from the website as well. We've got archives going all the way back to 2009. And uh, the easiest way, of course, to grab all of the audio, just download the free mobile app. The mobile app for your iPhone, your iPod, your iPad, your uh, Android phone or tablet. We've got apps available both at the iTunes App Store and at the Google Play Store. And links to both of those at the website vftb.net. You can also subscribe at YouTube. All of the audio from these these programs uh, uploaded to youtube.com slash Derek Gilbert. That's the uh, YouTube channel. And on social media, you'll find... uh, Discussion of these programs at facebook.com slash view from the bunker. And you can follow us on Twitter at view from bunker. My personal Twitter feed, of course, at Derek Gilbert. And of course, the new social media site one way.com slash Derek P Gilbert. You can go there as well and follow all of this stuff. Well, what is going on here in the United States? Uh, if you're not following NFL, uh, the NFL playoffs this weekend, which uh, now that the Bears just lost 16 15 to the Eagles. I'm out. <laughs> Got no reason to watch anymore. Uh, so if you're not paying attention to that, the most entertaining game in town is the United States Congress and what's going on with the government shutdown. White House officials, congressional aides met yesterday, Saturday, and again today, Sunday, to uh, negotiate reopening the federal government. Now, the whole federal government is not shut down. It's just a partial shutdown. So-called non-essential services. Of course, if you're the one whose paycheck has been interrupted, it seems pretty essential to you. And I I understand that. I've spent enough time unemployed in my adult life as uh, after college, I foolishly pursued a career in professional broadcasting. You might be able to tell from listening to this program why I gave up that uh, idea. Um, That Yeah, I made it as far as Philadelphia, which at the time was the fourth largest radio market. So I I did all right, but uh, the lifestyle is is foolish. Anyway, um, the... the, uh, the, the 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 essential government services, so-called essential, are, are still operating. Where we're most seeing it is in, uh, say, national parks and monuments and so forth, where things are shut down. And at some of the national parks, that means, of course, some basic services like, uh, you know, cleaning out the porta potties along hiking trails and stuff is not taking place. And that's getting a little ugly. Um but really what's what's going on here is that those federal employees who are being called into work and forced compelled to work without collecting a paycheck they they will get their back pay once the government is funded once again right now this is just a high stakes game of poker between the Trump administration and Democrats and it's all over 
the border wall. Now, the, the posturing is really silly when you start running the numbers. The administration wants $5 billion to build a border wall between the United States and Mexico. Democrats aren't budging. They say it's immoral. Now, of course, if we really started checking into the uh, living accommodations of some of the uh, ranking Democrats in Congress and some of the others who oppose the idea of a border wall, you find that many of them have uh, personal security that is quite um, effective and in some cases includes a wall around the property on which they live. So, uh, again, it's not about do as I do. It's just listen to what I say and shut up. That's why. When you run the numbers, the $5 billion the Trump administration is asking for to secure the southern border is really a drop in the budget. In fiscal year 2019, the federal budget for the United States is estimated at $4.4 trillion. $4.4 trillion with a T, which includes about a $985 billion deficit. And do we need to talk about that? Well, that's a bill that's going to have to be paid someday. And bear in mind, whenever the politicians start throwing about the numbers on the federal deficit, it's uh, about a quarter, a third to a quarter of what it actually is, according to the former comptroller of the United States, because it doesn't include unfunded liabilities, things the government has promised to pay in the future, for which there is currently no funding. So when they say the trillion, and I lost track, it's something like $22 trillion is the official deficit, the federal, the official federal deficit. It's actually on the high side of $70 trillion the last time I checked. If you did the accounting, if the government did accounting the way uh, accounting agencies, by law, have to account, you have to keep their books. Anyway, when you figure this out, just do the math. A $5 billion request for the border wall is less than, it's at roughly one-tenth of one percent of federal spending, estimated federal spending for this fiscal year. One-tenth of one percent of the federal budget. It is a drop in the bucket compared to what the government is actually going to spend. It's about half of one percent of the deficit. And many of those who are now calling this wall immoral were, in fact, in favor of the wall, or something like it, under previous presidential administrations specifically Democratic presidential administrations. This dog and pony show is like watching a television soap opera or professional wrestling with better clothes. The point is that their positions change depending on what they think you have forgotten. The Democrats who oppose the wall now are betting that their constituents will forget, and that most of the rest of us, the independent voters, the ones who swing back and forth, will forget that they were all in favor of a wall under Bill Clinton and under Barack Obama. It's, it's the way soap operas act. You're supposed to forget that the guy who's playing this role today was, hey, wasn't this character dead five years ago? Yeah, yeah, it's like Bobby Ewing stepping out of the shower in that episode of Dallas and immediately erasing an entire season of uh, plot because the plot was stupid. That's the way politicians operate. Their positions change because they assume, and sadly, they're usually correct, else they wouldn't continue to be reelected, that we forget. That we forget that they in the recent past supported exactly the opposite position of the one that they are shutting down the government for today. So we'll see who budges first because both sides are staking their political reputations on this. As I said last week, for President Trump, if he blinks on this, and Ann Coulter has already gone on record as saying she thinks that Trump will blink, if he blinks and backs down after going this far, His core supporters, the people who voted for him in 2016, will abandon him in droves. Again, Charlie Brown trying to kick the football. After a certain number of repetitions, you finally get the idea that you ain't never going to get that football. And you just give up trying. Uh, The economic impact of the shutdown already beginning to hit. Some examples, uh, airlines can't get permission to add new planes to their fleets. Mortgage lenders... 
This is something that uh, I can understand because I was in the real estate, sold real estate for a while. I was a realtor for uh, several years, decades ago. But because the government, through the FHA, verifies income for borrowers and then issues the insurance, the mortgage insurance, for a large percentage of mortgages written today, um, with the government shut down, no, that's not happening. So this is going to start to affect the real estate business here very soon. Um, <laughs> and one person pointed out that uh, even worse, breweries can't sell new beer because they're waiting for the government to approve new labels. Oh, the horror. Well, uh, maybe, you know, this is something, though. We talked about national parks earlier and the shutdown of national parks. Now, I, I will note that uh, the Trump administration at least isn't doing what the Obama administration did, where they actually sent armed uh, personnel to the national parks and made a really big show of shutting things down and even erecting barriers around federal monuments, national monuments, to really point out to people, the Republicans are... Sh- you can't see this monument because the Republicans in Congress are... So at least Trump isn't doing that. But maybe this is an idea. Maybe this is a really good reason we should take all of these national parks and federal land and return administration of all of these national parks over to the states and let the states collect the tax revenue needed to run them. So the next time Congress and a presidential administration cannot come to terms over something and will not pass a spending bill, you can still go see the Grand Canyon and have park rangers there and so forth. What do you think about that? The number one landowner, at least in the western United States, is the United States federal government. Maybe if we turn all of these national monuments and national parks back to the states... We could avoid this problem. I say this with tongue firmly in cheek because it ain't never going to happen. Now, the truth is that President Trump could get this wall done in a real hurry if he declared a national emergency and used the armed forces to do it. In fact, the uh, Democratic chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Adam Smith of Washington, said on uh, this week, the ABC Talking Heads program on Sunday morning, that the president does, in fact, have the authority to declare a national emergency and have the military build this wall. It would be worth seeing just to watch heads explode. Well, uh, the political posturing that began this week with the swearing in of a new Congress, it it took literally minutes, literally minutes for uh, representatives, Democratic representatives, to start introducing bills that will never, ever become law. But they're doing it to play to their base. A bill was introduced on Thursday to abolish the Electoral College. Why? Well, because Democrats are upset that uh, twice now, in recent memory, their candidate has won the popular vote, but not the Electoral College. And so they want to abolish the Electoral College. Now, Civics 101, Americans, the Electoral College was established by the framers of the Constitution to prevent large populous states... In our modern era, that would be New York, California, say, Texas, Illinois, and others from dominating the less populated states like the Dakotas, Wyoming, Idaho, say, Rhode Island. And a really good reason for setting up the government to prevent that, the uh, urban centers of the country from running things in the rural areas, is that people who live in cities have no clue about what is really important in the rural parts of the United States. I had to learn this my own self, and it took half a century to do it. I grew up in Chicago thinking that nothing in Illinois of any consequence happened south of Interstate 80, which would be south of Cook County, basically. Because when you grow up surrounded by, you know, three and a half million people in an urban area, you think that's your whole world. You don't really understand what's important to the farmers and the, uh, the oil field workers, the roughnecks, um, the coal miners in the southern part of the state. And there are different examples all across the country of how one part of a state, the people who live in the major metropolitan areas, California, you see the same thing there. The agricultural areas have, the people who live and work there don't have a lot in common with the people who live in, say, San Francisco or Los Angeles or San Diego. 
And so letting the people in those urban areas tell the people in rural areas how they should live, uh, not necessarily a great idea. And before we moved here to the Ozarks, we spent four years living in southern Illinois, and I came to understand why the people south of Interstate 80 in Illinois, there's a large number of them who'd be just as happy to see Chicago become its own state or, well, not literally fall into Lake Michigan, but just leave southern Illinois alone. Let southern Illinois run its own affairs. 30 years ago, I saw the same thing in Philadelphia. People live out in the Northeast, wanted to secede from the city. Didn't go anywhere. We're seeing a movement in California now to uh, break California up into a number of different states and let the agricultural, the rural areas run their own affairs. So uh, anyway, that's why we have an electoral college so that the uh, larger states have more influence but not enough to dominate via mob rule, via democracy, the rural America. If you look at the number of counties that President Trump won in the last election versus the number of uh, counties carried by Hillary Clinton, you, know, you would assume that it was a landslide. But because the counties that the president won tended to be more rural, less populated, the total number of votes for Hillary was was much greater. So anyway, Representative Steve Cohen of Tennessee, Democrat from Tennessee, introduced a bill to... Um, Eliminate the Electoral College and basically turn America into a democracy. Uh, Again, let's all say it together. America is a republic. We are a republic. Remember from the, you know, Pledge of Allegiance to the republic for which it stands. And there is a reason for it. It's to balance out the power between more effectively, more fairly, between the populous states and the less populous states, and that is why. Another, uh, and by the way, this don't don't panic over this bill because it's not going anywhere. It would require uh, what a two thirds uh, vote in in both the the House and the Senate, and three quarters of the states would have to pass it, and that is never ever going to happen. This is just Representative Cohen of Tennessee um, posturing for his. Uh, for his uh, constituency. Uh, But another plan has been voted now to uh, do the same thing, a similar thing with the United States Senate, because there are those out there who say the Senate is outmoded, obsolete, because horror of horrors, North Dakota gets the same number of senators as California, which means the influence of a senator from North Dakota could, if he's really sharp or she's really sharp, be just as much as a senator from California. When it comes to voting, of course, again, North Dakota's got the same number of votes. South Dakota, Wyoming, um, you know, the smaller states, Delaware, they get the same number of votes as the big states like Texas, California, New York, Illinois, etc. But again, the framers of the Constitution did that on purpose. This is a feature, not a bug. But a uh, professor at the Wharton School of uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, Eric Ortz, has uh, written an op-ed piece published at The Atlantic, um, suggesting that we start with the total U.S. population, divide by 100, and then allocate senators to each state according to their share of the total. And what would happen here is that you'd have 12 states that would stay with two senators, eight states would gain one or two, and the four biggest states, well, California would get 12 senators, Texas would get nine, Florida and New York would get six each. And states like Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Rhode Island, Vermont would get one. Again, the framers of the Constitution recognize the danger of mob rule. And if the news that we've seen over the last two years hasn't shown us why mob rule is a bad idea, then we're just not paying attention. I will say again, this is a feature, not a bug. Well, um, other news going to the Middle East. United States troop pullout in Syria now, according to National Security Advisor John Bolton, will be based on a uh, guarantee from Turkey that they will not kill all the Kurds. So uh, apparently, you know, for for whatever the, the word of, of Recep Tayyip Erdogan is worth, the president of Turkey, that apparently is the uh, only security that the Kurds are going to have. The Kurd, Well, that and the weapons that they can carry. Having said that, and, having, and recognizing that uh, we have um, made deals with the Kurds over the last 30 years to try to carry out our foreign policy in the Middle East, I still say we need to get our troops out of there. 
We don't need them in the middle of what is a, is a becoming a sectarian war between Sunni and Shia Muslims in the Middle East. So anyway, John Bolton says it's going to slow down. Uh, President Trump now talking about a four month timeline. But uh, Bolton says it's contingent on Turkey's guarantee of Kurdish security. Bolton also visiting uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel today. Um, he is scheduled to visit the Golan Heights with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu tomorrow, Monday, if weather permits. Netanyahu is calling on the United States to recognize Israel's uh, sovereignty over the Golan Heights. That's that area north and east of the, the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. It's that uh, um, hilly region that uh, really is essential to Israeli security. I mean, you know, you put some mortars and tanks up there and you can fire into the Galilee and really cause a lot of damage um, to Israeli settlements all throughout and around the Sea of Galilee. So there's no way Israel's going to give it up recognizing or acknowledging Israeli sovereignty over that region would simply acknowledge reality on the ground. But we will see whether it will happen. And meanwhile, here in the United States, our first congressperson representing the Palestinian territories was sworn into office with Congress. This is uh, Rashida Tlaib. Uh, She represents Michigan's 13th congressional district, uh, Democrat, of course. On her very first day in office, she was sworn in on a copy of the Quran, cursed Donald Trump with a, uh, well, a a word I won't use on this program, and um, erased Israel on the map in her office. She's got a map of the Middle East on there, and she's got a sticky note on there with uh, uh, Palestine pointing to where Israel is. And, of course, her Democratic supporters, or Democrats, or rather Jews, who supported her in her congressional district, a bit dismayed at her reversal on the uh, BDS movement. That's the uh, boycott, divest, uh, sanction movement, trying to economically punish any company that does business in or with Israel. Anyway, uh, Tlaib sworn in on an English language version of the Quran, which is a 1734 translation that belonged to Thomas Jefferson. She claimed that her choice was to illustrate how Islam was integral to the founding of the United States. Either she's lying or she's completely ignorant of history, frankly. Go back and listen to the interview we had a few weeks ago with historian uh, Raymond Ibrahim. Well, and then the following week with Dr. Uh, Timothy Furnish, <laughs> uh, we basically did back-to-back weeks on uh, the reality of uh, the history of Islam and what uh, Muslims expect in the future, those that are looking for uh, prophetic fulfillment, which is, uh, frankly, the majority of them living in, uh, living in Asia and Africa. The, the first war fought by the United States before George Washington was even in office began because Muslim pirates operating out of North Africa began hijacking American ships, stealing the cargoes, and enslaving American sailors. Thomas Jefferson was not reading the Quran because it gave him guidance on how to frame the Constitution or write the Declaration of Independence. Forward Magazine wrote an article pointing out that the reason Jefferson had a Quran was to try to figure out how to um, witness to Muslims. The introduction to the Quran on which Ms. Tlaib was sworn into office reads, and I quote, Whatever use an impartial version of the Quran may uh, may be of in other respects, it is absolutely necessary to undeceive those who, from the ignorant or unfair translations which have appeared, have entertained too favorable an opinion of the original, and also to enable us effectually to expose the imposture, end quote. In other words, the Jefferson Quran was there to debunk the claims of Islam being a religion of peace, as Jefferson and John Adams found out when they asked the ambassador from Tripoli, why are you guys capturing our ships, stealing our cargoes, and enslaving our sailors? What did we do to you? Well, the answer, of course, was, you're not Muslims. So, Quran says, we can do it. Well, again, Rashida Tlaib um, representing, in theory, Michigan's 13th Congressional District, actually, apparently, representing the uh, <laughs> the Prophet Muhammad. 
Uh, an American institution preparing to close its doors. Sears on its last legs. The uh, chairman of Sears Holdings, Eddie Lampert, was trying desperately, still trying desperately, to uh, come up with a plan to save 425 stores out of bankruptcy, put together a $4.6 billion package backed by Bank of America, Citigroup, and Royal Bank of Canada. However, Bloomberg's reporting that, uh, uh, Bloomberg rather, reporting that there are gaps in the financing plan. It wouldn't have provided enough cash to cover the costs related to bankruptcy. So apparently they've got until Tuesday to try to come up with a plan that will keep Sears and Kmart opening. Sears has been around for 125 years. It really revolutionized the retail industry in the United States around the turn of the, uh, the late 19th and early 20th century. But uh, Amazon has uh, put a hurt on many retailers, and Sears is just one. Again, if they can't come up with a plan by Tuesday, it looks like the 425 stores that are still open are going to close their doors for good. The uh, amount that they had wanted to pony up in this uh, last-minute bid to uh, save the stores was not even enough to... um, was not enough to cover the uh, inventory of the stores. Liquidators are promising to pay more than what Lampert was uh, offering in this deal, so... um, yeah. Uh, Sears has really been limping along back in October when it filed for Chapter 11. It closed about 140 stores then. Again, about 425 still to be affected. And uh, if they can't come up with something by Tuesday, it looks like Sears will just uh, become history. Although there's no way to tell what's going to come out of the bankruptcy filings and the liquidation filings. Somebody may buy the rights to the name and uh, recycle it somehow. We shall see. Um, startling news. This Just the last couple of days... Uh, Breitbart News reported that the number one cause of death around the world in 2018, the number one cause of death worldwide in 2018 with 41 million, 41 million deaths was abortion. As of December 31st, according to Worldometers, 41.9 million abortions performed over the course of the year. That's more than five times the second leading cause of death. 8.2 million people died from cancer, 5 million from smoking, 1.7 million died of HIV AIDS. World, world, Worldometers or Worldometers uh, was voted one of the best free reference websites by the American Library Association. So apparently not really an axe to grind here. But they keep a running tally through the year of major world statistics, including population, births, deaths, automobiles produced, books published, and uh, CO2 emissions even. But uh, they've been tracking the total number of abortions based on the latest statistics published by the World Health Organization. So again, not really a partisan group here. Get this, just about, slightly under a quarter of all pregnancies 23% of all pregnancies were ended by abortion in 2018. Think about that. One in four ended by abortion. For every 33 live births, 10 infants were aborted. More deaths from abortion in 2018 than all deaths from cancer, malaria, HIV, AIDS, smoking, alcohol, and traffic accidents combined. There's a sobering statistics. But you wouldn't know it if uh, you went to Snopes.com to fact check it, because according to Snopes, abortion is not the number one cause of death in the world in 2018, because according to Snopes, abortions are a medical procedure and not a cause of death. Quoting, Stating that abortion is the leading cause of death worldwide, as opposed to a medical procedure, is a problematic pronouncement because that stance takes a political position, one which is at odds with the scientific-slash-medical world. However, in the next paragraph, Snopes Snopes cites a uh, a source, a biologist, who admits that human life begins at conception, quoting again, concluding an entry on the topic, Rational Wiki quotes developmental biologist Scott Gilbert, no relation, in saying that the entity created by fertilization is indeed a human embryo, and it has the potential to be a human adult, i.e., it 
is alive. Whether these facts are enough to accord it personhood is a question influenced by opinion, philosophy, and theology rather than by science, end quote. So what they're saying is, okay, it's a life, but your opinion, philosophy, and theology, you know, science can't tell you whether or not it's right or wrong to terminate it. Your opinion, philosophy, and theology will guide you in determining whether or not it is right or wrong to terminate that life. Well, yeah, that's kind of what we're saying. It is a life. Abortion stops that life, kills it, terminates it. In other words, it is a cause of death. Snopes is not a fact-checking website. It is propaganda. And sadly, they have weighed in now clearly on the side of the culture of death. Oh, man. Well, we've got uh, an eye-opening program tonight. You might be old enough, like me, to remember back in the 80s a number of rather spectacular claims of satanic ritual abuse, Satanism infiltrating our, ci- our cities, and then suddenly it was all declared a great big hoax. Mass hysteria caused by wacky Christians. Well, that was fake news. Coming up, cult crimes expert Dr. Gregory Reed. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. If Donald Trump's election was an earthquake, his accomplishments since are the aftershocks the world never saw coming. Even while President Trump has had to war against dark forces who aim to obstruct and ultimately impeach him, his seismic impact on culture and faith in America is undeniable. Skywatch TV is proud to announce the Trump Aftershock special offer, featuring the new book by best-selling author Stephen E. Strang, Trump Aftershock. In Trump Aftershock, you'll learn how Trump's agenda aims to combat the media's fake news war with the president, address the surge of illegal immigration, expose the deep state and the agenda of former President Obama, strengthen ties with Israel, find lasting peace in the Middle East, and so much more. When you purchase Trump Aftershock from the Skywatch TV store, you'll also receive God and Donald Trump by Stephen E. Strang. The 2016 presidential election was perhaps the biggest political upset in American history and still has many Christians and Americans contemplating the possibility of a divine connection between God and Donald Trump. Now you can understand the answer to that question and so much more in the must-read book that reaches far beyond politics and into the redeeming frequencies that America surely needs in God and Donald Trump. Sold separately, these items hold a retail value of $44. Yours now for your donation of only $30 plus shipping and handling. These two books will cut through the media noise and reveal what they won't cover while objectively helping you understand what our nation's most unlikely and unconventional president has accomplished thus far and what you can expect looking forward. The Trump Aftershock Special Offer, available now at the Skywatch TV store. Order online or call 1-844-750-4985. Cutting edge analysis of end times prophecy on the very ground where it all unfolds. It's the Skywatch TV Wars of the Gods Tour of Israel, May 12th through 23rd, 2019, hosted by Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Pastor Carl Gallup's best selling author of Gods and Thrones and Gods of Ground Zero, Messianic Rabbi Zev Parat of Messiah of Israel Ministries, and filmmakers Justin and Wes Fall, producers of the Hollow Earth Chronicles. This is a once in a lifetime tour of the Holy Land from Mount Hermon to the Dead Sea. You'll walk in Jesus' footsteps on the battleground of the supernatural war with preaching and teaching along the way. Shiloh, Bethel, Mount Carmel, Nazareth, the Jordan River, the Mount of Olives, Sea of Galilee, the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jerusalem where the final battle will be fought for God's Mount of Assembly, Zion. The Skywatch TV Wars of the Gods Tour of Israel. Reserve your place now. For information and registration, log on to LipkinTours.com. That's LipkinTours.com. Drop. 
Driving the Internet to Think, live every Sunday night. This is A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Coming up in our final segment tonight, we'll touch on a few other things in the news. Earth's magnetic field is weakening. There's another Ebola scare, this time in Sweden. Rivers are turning blood red. Sounds very prophetic. And you'll never guess the reason for the earthquake warnings that are being posted on old buildings in Portland, Oregon. All that and more coming up after 8.30 Central Time tonight. Our guest tonight has a resume that uh, is not likely to show up on your desk or the desk of anyone that you know anytime soon. Uh, More than 20 years as a uh, criminal justice trainer, training law enforcement on occult crimes and crimes against children, retired private investigator, now an author and pastor. He is the uh, author of a number of books, including Trojan Church, A Cry in the Wilderness, The Color of Pain, most recently War of the Ages, a complete scriptural guide to confronting and defeating Satan's kingdom. He is the uh, founder of and Director of Youth Fire Ministry. We welcome Dr. Gregory Reed to the program. Greg, thanks for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure. It's good to be with you. We had the opportunity and uh, the blessing to meet at the, uh, the uh, oh gosh, the uh, <laughs> I'm forgetting the name of the conference, Judd Burton's conference down and Dan uh, Crestman's conference down there in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, uh, Return of the Giants. Yes, the Giants of Old Conference. Uh, and I, I had seen you previously in... The film, the documentary film by Jared Crestman and Tom Dunn called Detestable, which um, the, the research I've done for my couple of books, The uh, the Great Inception, Last Clash of the Titans, on an intellectual level, a level and, and looking at, at what the ancient world, the pagans believed about their gods and how God responded to that in the Bible, you know, that that's one level of, of head knowledge that I have about the spirit spiritual war that uh, we're involved in but uh, it struck me in watching that film that uh, you've got a whole different level of experience for you this war appears to be a lot more real absolutely and uh i you know as as when when i became a christian when i was very young at 15 and god delivered me out of the occult and you know a background of uh, some pretty well just just call it ritual abuse um, I was just glad to have survived. I didn't know what it all meant, but uh, I was uh, called into ministry at a pretty young age and uh, carried that out, went to Bible school, did a number of ministries. But in 1986, I became aware that something else was going on, and I was feeling a need to at least tell people, hey, I know about the occult. I used to practice it. You need to be careful. I was thinking entirely in a church concept. Uh, speaking at churches, if that would have been the opportunity. But instead, I moved uh, to another city where I met someone who she, the Lord had helped her to establish a ministry to educate churches about the dangers of the occult. And it was in 1987 that there was a a tsunami of occult-related crimes across this nation that is, I think, unprecedented. And for the next 10 years, particularly, uh, I ended up being involved in training not just churches, but uh, opportunities opened up to train criminal justice classes, because law enforcement and criminal justice people, uh, and people in a hospital setting and military setting, they were coming across all of the stuff they didn't understand, Uh, crime scenes where animals had been sacrificed, or even humans and they didn't know why. They didn't know what the symbols meant. They didn't know any of that. And we kind of learned as we got along, and we started to see that this was not isolated. Um, and once I started to actually go to funerals of victims, I realized this was something very serious. And we continued to carry it out, this training and actually working hand-in-hand hand with criminal justice and therapists and law enforcement for that whole 10 years, and I think we did a lot to educate people, to educate law enforcement, to get churches aware that the the spiritual warfare was real and a lot of their kids were at risk, and um, we came up at the end of that, and all of a sudden there is this huge backlash that came out of nowhere uh, that was saying that this stuff was all made up. It didn't happen. There were no victims. Satanism was not dangerous. Uh, uh, Devil worship was just isolated incidents of crazy people. And it was breathtaking that they were able to kind of reduce our network from about 250 people uh, in, let's say, 1990, 
one down to about maybe five or six people that even were doing this anymore. How did how did that happen? I mean, I mean, did they convince them that this wasn't real, or, or did they were there physical uh, threats that that convinced people that maybe they were better off not uh, getting involved in, in this kind of work anymore? There was a small handful uh, in law enforcement, and I understand that they were convinced that there really it was much to do about nothing. And based on the casework that they had, I could understand why they could see that. Uh, I was working with other law enforcement people that were receiving direct threats. There was a rather large case that uh, some friends of mine were working on. Uh, They were actually just doing a training for other law enforcement. And some police officers had asked to meet them afterwards and uh, brought them several, I I guess, 20 or 30 boxes, like the big uh, paper boxes you get at Office Depot or Office Max full of files on one case that they were working on and they said you guys want to work this case work it we want to live we've got families we can't do this anymore and they were being threatened to the point where they decided the best thing they could do is just stay out and so we lost a number of people that they got close enough to cases that they were threatened um in one way they just felt like they couldn't do it they had to protect their families and i understood that too And then the spiritual component kicked in, and I saw a lot of uh, my associates who didn't understand spiritual warfare uh, getting hit on a million different fronts, and they finally just bailed out. So it was a pretty complete attack. But the the interesting thing was is the backlash came from um, one portion of law enforcement from one person who uh, was with the Behavioral Science Department of the FBI, who just came out and said, I've checked the evidence, there's nothing, not one hair, not one drop of blood, nothing. Which for us, I mean, I was in my office sitting on two file cabinets full of working cases. That was pretty ridiculous to me. But he was at the head of all that people had to say is, well, the FBI says, and pretty soon we didn't have the ability to talk back to that because we didn't have the public forum uh, like we had. And the second one came from the therapeutic community and a group called the False Memory Syndrome Foundation that rose up out of nowhere. And they began to accuse all these victims of having false memories. We lost a number of court cases in which we advocated with the families and the children uh, and went along with them because of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Um, And then there was a Christian uh, uh, group of people who decided to start writing articles about people who had claimed that they had come out of Satanism and the occult and destroyed their reputations and destroyed their their ministries. And uh, we were just kind of left, you know, with our breaths taken away at the end of it. Hmm. Now, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, uh, that's a group that, uh, do I remember correctly that uh, James Randi, the Amazing Randi, was uh, was part of that group? I think that is correct. Um, and they had a number of people who, you know, referred to that as the organization to, to, uh, to go with if you wanted to understand the truth. Unfortunately, one of their top uh, experts, uh, Dr. Ralph Underweger, had been quoted in a Danish, or pardon me, a Dutch pedophile magazine, as encouraging pedophiles to accept their God-given orientation. Right. And so, you know, but he was paid hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, by uh, defense lawyers who brought him in to testify that children were lying, that they made up these stories, that they got their stories from parents' pornographic collection. Um. It was pretty effective in the courts because what thing we had to learn about the court system, and I understand, is you almost had to leave the occult element out of it. You had to prosecute strictly on the crime because the other uh, uh, elements that would get were bring in. Here's the way it was told me: if you have a a trial, let's say you're trying to convict somebody of molesting a child, if you have a jury of twelve people, there's a good chance that Two, three, maybe four of those jurors are sexual abuse victims. Okay, you tracking with me so far? Mm-hmm. So these two to three to four sexual abuse victims probably haven't worked through any of their abuse issues. So when you see a kid coming up on the stand and saying he's abused, and then you see this gentleman dressed in a three-piece suit, and he's the pillar of the community, 
well, they're not going to convict him because they're still thinking it was their fault that they got abused. Now, if you throw Satanism on top of that, you've lost the whole jury right there because it's hard enough to believe that adults want to have sex with children. Mm -hmm. When you throw Satanism on top of that, you can forget about it. So it got very complex complex in the court systems, and we began to lose more cases than we were actually able to win for the children. Hmm. There was a case that um, I remember just about the time Sharon and I started producing our podcast, PID Radio, and the PID stands for Peering into Darkness, uh, because of cases like this one that caught our attention. And it was a case that actually wound up inspiring the first series, the first season of the HBO series, uh, True Detective. Uh, this was the um, the Hosanna Church case in Ponchatoula, Louisiana. Yes. And you, what you described here is kind of what I remember from the case there, that uh, there were all sorts of um, uh, aspects, details of the case that were... that. Uh, that had occult, uh, uh, you know, written all over it, uh, you know, ritual garments and, and symbols and sigils scribed on the walls of, of the inside of the church, the youth group room. Um, and yet none of that stuff, if I remember correctly, made it into the, uh, made it into the courtroom. Well, and let me tell you why. And without mentioning a particular person's name, let's just say that they brought, when the case broke, when we saw it, uh, our immediate response was to send the chief every bit of information we could. Because we knew if we didn't get to him first, somebody else was going to get in on the case. Mm-hmm. And so we sent them all. I mean, we never insinuated ourselves into cases. I'm not a cop groupie. I just need to know. If they don't know what they're dealing with, then then they're going to miss a lot of big clues. And so we automatically sent all the information to him and said, please read this Um ASAP before you go any further in the investigation. Well, apparently they took uh, a retired um, uh, person in law enforcement out of cold storage and sent him down to Louisiana to shut down the occult aspects of the case. And it, as it was told to me by someone who had firsthand knowledge that this gentleman came in and said, we are not going to deal with this occult. I want this shut down. I want it stopped right now. Hmm. So they deliberately shut down the occult aspect of the case. And this is a guy that is well known for doing that wherever an occult aspect comes up. Hmm. So what what uh, signs do you look for that, occult, that, that a crime may have uh, occult connections to it? Uh, there's a number of things. One is the date on which it took place. Oh. You know, there's a calendar of dates that have to deal with the occult. Uh, and there are some dates that are more pernicious than others. April 30th, to some people's surprise, is one of the the, the most important dates on a occult crime calendar because, uh, you know, that's just got all sorts of implications for them in terms of the magical workings and, the you know, uh, whatever. All the solstices and the uh, equinoxes are dates they like to do these things, and it depends on the group. And that's where we were very careful. I did an eight-hour block for law enforcement in which I would go through this one thing at a time and say, these are the calendar dates. But that doesn't mean if you go out in the middle of nowhere and you see a bunch of people dancing around with no clothes that they're Satanists or that they're devil worshipers. They could be Wiccans. Wiccans are not necessarily breaking law. We don't have to like what they're doing, but that is their protected religion as long as they're not injuring anyone or breaking the law. However, there are other groups that use the April 30th or the equinox or the solstice for more nefarious purposes. So I get them to kind of broaden their view in when crimes happen on certain dates that they'll take the next step and take another look and say, is there anything that could lead to a belief that this was done for occult purposes? And so if they actually are working a crime, then you start to ask, let's say it was a homicide. Were there markings on the body? Were there body parts missing? Were there symbols on the body? Were there things around, uh, like red cord that was tied around trees? There was a whole host of things that could indicate that there was a level of rituality here in the crime that was taking place. So there was a plethora of things. The dates was important. The symbols were important. Uh, The type of victim 
uh, even things like how the body was um, displayed if it was left, um, colors. And then it, it started to get up wrapped up in other religions like um, a santeria, brujeria, and some of the more uh, current uh, occult practices. And then you're dealing with a whole another plethora of colors and ropes and jewelry and conscious shells. And so hmm. Hmm. that was yeah. the important thing to us is that law enforcement was fully trained uh, t- to go in and, and not have any preconceived ideas. But we're able to go in and look at it from a cop's perspective and say, this is out of place. Let's see what this is about. Or this person was attached to that person. Let's go ask them some questions. And this became very important to me in a case that we, uh, I was involved with through a family member in 1989, I believe, uh, or 90. I can't remember which at this point. I'd have to refer to my notes, but where uh, a young couple disappeared, a boy and a girl, 15 and 16 years old. They disappeared uh, during uh, Labor Day weekend that year and were never seen. And uh, their aunt had contacted me for help. And so we got fast after it and did some broadcasts, if anybody's seen them. Uh, the sad story is both kids were involved in a group that started out as a Dungeons & Dragons group then went into white magic and then turned out to be a drug and black magic type of Satan worshiping group of older teenagers and some older adults as well. We could never make those connections positive, but the group we knew about and these, this young couple was uh, their bodies were found uh, right after November that year. They'd been shotgunned to death. Um, Their feet had been cut off and uh, the girl's uh, baby was missing. Hmm. And so I was at that funeral, and the entire gang showed up to the funeral wearing their flags, and uh, all of them got away with it. So it's always burned in me when I hear people say this stuff doesn't happen. I'm like, you know what? I was there. This was real. Hmm. What is the significance of um, the the uh, and the calendar, the equinoxes, the solstices? What, what is significant about those particular times of year? Uh, just from a magical standpoint, and it goes back for centuries with all sorts of different groups, whether it's Wiccan or Druid, uh, they believe like, you know, in the, in the, the, it has to do with the changing of the seasons and that there are a lot of things that happen spiritually during that time. You know, for example, even something like Halloween or well, All Hallows Eve, whatever you want to call it, that was very important to the Druid world because that's the day they believe that the, the, the God of the underworld, uh, uh, Samhain would be released from the underworld to roam the earth along with all the spirits of the dead. And so they would do a lot of ritual magic to protect themselves. Same thing with a lot of ritual, uh, like Wiccan groups believe there are certain days where the doors to the supernatural are more open than other dates for whatever reason. And so some of the purposes behind why those dates are very old and uh, they continue to be used by those groups for either, um, you know, legal purposes in worship or non-legal purposes. There seems to be, and I read this in a lot of the research I've done on the ancient world, ancient Mesopotamia, about uh, boundaries, liminal um, magic, uh, doorways, or uh, as you say, uh, times of the year when the days begin to lengthen or shorten or... Um, uh, every month, the, uh, the in a lunar calendar, the thirtieth day of the month, the, the the night of no moon, was a night that was um, where the veil between the worlds, the boundary between the worlds, was thinnest, and that's when uh, the ancient Amorites, Canaanites, Babylonians believed that they had to leave, uh, they, they had to serve a ritual meal for their dead ancestors. Otherwise, uh, you know, grandma, great grandpa would get upset and make your life hell, literally. Um, and this was more than just setting out food like, you know, cookies for Santa Claus. There was a ritual involved where they had to be summoned by name. Uh, so this this idea of boundaries probably has something to do with the the significance of the uh, the, the rituals and, and those times of year. Um, the uh, uh, the well, let me address the, that just for a quick sure. second because uh-huh. it's important. That, because one of the things we had to do with law enforcement is there was superstition and there was facts. You know, my dad was a LAPD for a number of years. And so I learned from him as a private investigator, uh, supposition is not fact. So you had to learn in this, we had to 
try and train officers to deal with the difference between superstition and facts. Superstition is, would say naturally, because we're so media oriented, that you have to watch out on a full moon. That's when all the bad things will be happening. Mm -hmm. But what you say uh, from your standpoint as a researcher confirms what we were teaching at the time that it is in fact when there's no moon, that you're going to watch out for the darkest crimes because they do believe that is the night when the barriers come down. And one of the things, I, 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 I'm going to be careful on the details, but I've got a friend that works somewhat undercover in the Wiccan community, and some of the things that are coming out of there right now, they're telling him, we don't know what's happening, but these portals and doors are opening, and what's coming through is not good, and we can't control it. That's really interesting because that, believe it or not, that came up during the uh, research that uh, Josh Peck and I did for our book on the UFO phenomenon, uh, the day the Earth stands still, because there has been a rise, and this was confirmed by uh, researcher and author uh, William Ramsey, who's produced a film called um, The Smiley Face Killers. And it deals with chaos magic, which is an outgrowth of the magical system that Aleister Crowley developed 100 years ago. And it's gone in a couple of different directions, one being the uh, <laughs> the belief among certain strains of the occult that the god of chaos, uh, to the Egyptians called Set, to the Greeks called Typhon, is out there somewhere in space in the vicinity of uh, the star Sirius, but is coming back. Mm -hmm. And the uh, personal secretary of Crowley, Kenneth Grant, Took this, uh, took his system Telema, and transformed it into what he called the uh, Typhonian order or the Typhonian tradition, referring to the Greek god of chaos, Typhon. But um, William Ramsey told me that uh, one of the aspects of uh, the, the smiley face uh, murders, which surprised him, was finding out that the symbol of the smiley face is uh, common among those who practice chaos magic. So oh. it's it's very odd, and, and and here's the thing that that connects it to the the whole UFO phenomenon: the two major outreach organizations trying to make contact with the uh, with extraterrestrial civilizations are called SETI. One stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and the other is C SETI, the uh, Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. But SETI is an Egyptian word, an Egyptian name. In fact, the father of uh, the Pharaoh Ramses the Great was named SETI. It just means man of Set. Man of the Chaos God. Mm -hmm. So there's the, this belief among some occultists that this God is returning and that they better figure out how to control it before it gets here, or at least be on you know what they think is going to be the winning side. Um, my thought is that this idea that the, that uh, th somehow these rebel angels, these these uh, small G gods from the ancient world, uh, are going to somehow deconstruct the uh, order that God established out of chaos in Genesis 1 verse 2 where his spirit was hovering over the deep and the word, uh, the Hebrew word translated deep is tahom which is the Hebrew version of the uh, Sumerian word tiamat which was their, ver their word for name for Leviathan, in wow. other words the chaos wow. monster, so you know God subdued it, Yahweh subdued it in, in the second verse of the Bible but it's not dead yet, it's not destroyed yet so Leviathan, Tiamat, Set Typhon, whatever, it's still out there. And I think the whole point of this is to try, on the part of these rebel angels, is to deconstruct God's creation and return it to chaos. Yes. Well, and, you know, when I've, both from a spiritual and, an, and a, you know, tired press, private investigator standpoint, one of the things that was important to me, if, if there were law enforcement that were believers, is they understood this isn't an either-or proper position when you deal with occult crimes. You're dealing with, first of all, you know, real facts on the ground situation that have implications as far as crime and punishment or whatever, but you also have spiritual implications that if you don't understand the big picture of where all this is going, a lot of it's not going to make sense. And, and of course, this is just my subjective um, theory on this that I have developed over a number of years is why the big push from like 80, maybe 84 or 5, all the way into 1995 or 96. Why the big push for these crimes to where actually one uh, law enforcement in Florida called these crimes endemic or pandemic? That's how many they were dealing with nationally. 
And I can attest to that. I've, you know, got over 800 files of different things we were working on. Hmm. Um, and that was just me. So the other, well, why? What was, as a Christian, I know the enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy. He's got an agenda. Um, and we are coming to a point before Jesus' return where he is going to get a lot more leeway than we'd like him to have uh, in this world. Uh, and and so how do we perceive something like this? And I saw this big thing that happened with all the crimes and the murders and the suicides and the child abuse. is almost like a satanic John the Baptist coming in and paving the way for the powers and the principalities in human blood. I mean, I know yes. that sounds uh, uh, chilling, but that's what I believe was happening, that there was an agenda to this that has to do with where we're at now and becoming, in the last 20 years, almost a completely secularized, godless pagan society. You, you don't understand how that can happen unless you understand the spiritual implications we're talking about. Uh, no, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, you anticipated my question. I was going to ask about the mid '80s and what was it about that time frame that uh, that led to this? Was it uh, the, you know leading up to the turn of the millennium? Was it leading up to 2012 and the whole uh, you know Mayan apocalypse uh, thing? Or uh, you, you know is there a, a what is it? I mean, if we had to hazard a guess, I mean, because I know we only see into this realm. Uh, what is it, uh, Paul's phrase? Is as, as though through like looking darkly, yeah, yeah. through a glass darkly. Yeah, like we're looking into a darkened room, but using a mirror, so everything's backwards and dimly lit. So, um, <laughs> and why did it seem to tail off after ninety five? I guess is another question. Any any thoughts? Uh, one thought is that. They- went underground at some point because they had succeeded in shutting the rest of us up and they were just biding time because we're starting to see some of these crimes come back Hmm. and some of them are mutating in some of the you know the south american uh, religions like santa muerte and some of the other ones that are getting there's a number of things that are happening south of us and nations like uh uh, uh, well like you know colombia and and some of those that are so rife with occult crimes. Some tribes in Africa that are seeing their teenagers disappeared and sacrificed for religious purposes. So it's mutated in some ways, but in America, I think it went underground. Maybe this is too arrogant, God forgive me if it is, but we did a lot of damage during the 80s. I mean, we had trained nearly every law enforcement uh, agency in the state of Texas, and they were uncovering crimes. People were being convicted of crimes. Um, and everybody was on the alert. And so, but after the backlash, uh, it all disappeared because I think, first of all, that was a period of time where they had, what did somebody call it? It's called an availing time. I'm just remembering this. And availing time in the occult world is when they think they're going to get the maximum bang for the buck for what they're doing. Hmm. in the supernatural and i believe that that period of time was what they would call the availing time and now they've kind of gone underground because they can they can uh, do so and continue to do what they do without any suspicion because nobody's looking at it anymore nobody believes that this stuff happens anymore and if they were good at covering up their crimes in the 80s before we started exposing and you can imagine they've learned a thing or two since then Hmm. Um, so they can afford to be kind of underground and still do the things and not get caught the way they were getting caught before. Hmm. We're talking with Dr. Gregory Reed of Youth Fire Ministries. His website is gregoryreed.com. It's R-E-I-D. And uh, coming up, we will talk a little bit more about specifically how the uh, powers that try to cover up, and by powers I mean you know principalities, thrones, dominions, cosmic rulers over this present darkness, uh, cover up this type of work, satanic panic, as we continue our conversation with Dr. Gregory Reed on A View from the Bunker, right after this.
Churches and educational establishments from universities down to elementary schools are embracing New Age philosophy and are being seduced by heavy demonic forces that are masquerading as angels of light, ascended masters, spirit guides, and even Jesus Christ himself. Skywatch TV is proud to announce the second coming of the New Age official collection. When you order the new book, The Second Coming of the New Age by Stephen Bancars and Josh Peck, you'll receive the brand new DVD, Beyond Supernatural, which includes never-before-released off-the-record interviews with the authors, detailing their long history of involvement with the New Age, and personal testimonies of their deliverance by Jesus Christ. And as a bonus, this DVD includes the entire Skywatch TV five-part series exposing the infiltration of the new age. Plus, you'll also receive on DVD The Book of Enoch, Fallen Angels, and Ancient Aliens, an exclusive production with Dr. Michael Heiser regarding the blatant lies of ancient astronaut theory and the horrifying nature of fallen angels and alien abduction. Also included is the brand new audio series, Doctrines of Devils. Listen as Stephen Bancars interviews Doreen Virtue, world-renowned former best-selling author and teacher for the New Age, as she explains her incredible Incredible supernatural journey out of the occult and into the arms of Jesus. This over 12 hour series features bonus interviews with Dr. Chuck Missler, Dr. Thomas Horn, John McTurnan, Gary Bates, and many more on the subjects of ghosts, demons, and the supernatural. But that's not all. You'll also receive the oversized, beautifully republished classic masterpiece in hardback Myths and Legends of Babylonia and Assyria. This work provides not only the account of the mystery of the ancients, but extracts and presents to the reader the occultism driving much of the New Age and heretical doctrines today. Sold separately, these items hold a retail value of over $150. Yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. You can have access to everything you need to arm yourself against the onslaught of pervading spiritual darkness now. The Second Coming of the New Age official collection is available Available now at skywatchtvstore.com. Order now or call 1 844 750 4985. Streaming live to the web every Sunday night, this is A View from the Bunker, live from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. I'm Derek Gilbert. Next Sunday night, this will be January 13th, we'll talk about freeing the Word of God from the Bible. Can we? Should we? We'll talk with author Keith Giles about his, for, his uh, most recent book, Jesus Unbound, Liberating the Word of God from the Bible. That is next Sunday night again, January 13th, on A View from the Bunker, live, vftb.net. Our guest this week, Dr. Gregory Reed of Youth Fire Ministries, the author of a number of books, including War of the Ages, A Complete Scriptural Guide to Confronting and Defeating Satan's Kingdom. And all it takes is a quick look at the, the headlines to see that Satan and his minions are still... Uh, having a field day out there across the uh, the world. It's just that uh, the difference between us today in our enlightened world, especially here in the West, and our forefathers, say, two, three centuries ago and prior, is that when they saw evil at work in the world, they recognized it for what it was. Today, we seem to think it has to do with a chemical imbalance in the blood or brain, uh, lack of government programs, or some such. Uh, Greg, you mentioned that about 30 years ago, we saw a period of about 10, 12 years where there were literally hundreds of of occult-related crimes that were popping up and uh, uh, documented in your files. And yet, when we look back on that period of history now, uh, it's usually referred to by people who consider themselves intelligent as satanic panic. It was all made up that somehow America went crazy thanks to Geraldo Rivera or something and uh, just invented the whole thing. How was history rewritten? Oh, it was, it was very, um, well, you know, those that have the money and have the power and have the uh, ability to um, uh, manipulate uh, things like social media now and the Internet, they didn't have quite the capacity back then. But we were always, um, we were always re- uh, having to deal with the skeptical uh, media to some degree. But then the media, I mean, the, here's the deal about the media. I am not a fan of the media mm-hmm. at all. 
Uh, but the law of the media is if it bleeds, it leads. Right. And so they hopped on this like white on rice and began to um, – and did they promote the panic? Maybe a little bit. But that doesn't mean there wasn't a reason for real concern. Uh, I did the, one of the original Geraldo shows uh, when we had the student Mark Kilroy that was murdered in Matamoros, Mexico by someone that was, had been raised as a brujo, as a witch. And, uh, you know, there were all these horrible, horrible sacrifices that took place. That was a wake-up call. Other people came forward and said, it happened to me. And at the same time, we had the verbal testimony. We also had crimes on the ground. I had just uh, uh, been debriefed by someone in, in the FBI on a case that had taken place a couple of years earlier of a, um, a young lady, I think she was 18, kidnapped from a country western bar and completely butchered by someone who was involved in Satanism, who mm. also, by the way, got away with that as well. Um, so we were dealing with the media that was giving this a lot of airtime. Um, and the problem is, is you had some people who actually were telling the truth, and you had some goofballs in the mix. Hmm. And that confused it. And so when the whoever was responsible for rewriting the history uh, went to work, they would find what they considered the goofballs or the people who couldn't prove their testimony. And they would start to they went after them and tried to expose any dirty little secrets in their past or whatever so that the testimonies would not be believed. And then they would always tout, to, you know, the famous uh, Ken Lanning from the FBI saying FBI crime is non-existent or it's just crazy people. And it slowly started to change people, their view of it. So on one hand, while we were still down in the blood and the mud of real life crimes and murders and suicides and crimes against children, they were already taking a hold of the media and coming back and to the point where Geraldo would come back and say, oh, yeah, well, I'm sorry I ever did that stuff. Hmm. And right up till the time I did, I think it was Montel Williams, somewhere around 1992 or three. I can't remember exactly. There was still, we still had a, for, a forum to tell the truth. One of the things that changed during that time was the uh, horrible murders that took place in West Memphis, Arkansas. Right, right. And I had just finished training at the uh, Texas Narcotics uh, Officers Association um, down around Houston. And one of the people who we trained was someone who was actually a coroner from that area. And uh, the minute the crimes happened, I had actually been in communication and he confirmed that it was what we thought it was of an occult nature. Now, nobody knew a whole lot at first, but he was one of the people that had a heads up that this probably was not just some random killing. Uh, so there was a lot of stuff that came out about that case that the public didn't know about. But by the time these kids were convicted of the crimes and went to jail, and I have a different perspective on it a little bit now, but they had already gotten, I think it was uh, HBO involved to right. do to uh, Paradise Lost series, and they rewrote the whole story and made uh, Damien Eccles look like a hero. Yeah. In fact, I've interviewed William Ramsey to bring him back into the conversation about his book, Abomination, which deals mm -hmm. with the West Memphis Three, and he cites the court documents so thoroughly in that book and shows the scanned documents so you can see that he's not making this stuff up. By the time you finish reading that book, you can't come to any other conclusion but that there was a serious... Uh, uh, that uh, Eccles and his, his cohorts were, were deep into the occult, and that had a lot to do with the uh, the deaths of those boys there in West Memphis. Well, and then the, the other side was, because I had a friend who actually testified in that trial, um, the, 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 from from the outside perspective, what, what HBO was able to do is to move public opinion against the facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so people said, yeah, I saw HBO. I know that that stuff wasn't real. You know, but here again, I was in a unique position of having to know, I'm knowing some of the people on the inside as well as, and I've never talked about this before, but I had a friend that was a prison minister up in Arkansas who sat down and allegedly uh, Damien Eccles received Christ. And my friend that was the prison minister didn't know that at the same time Damien Eccles was bleeding the Wiccan community for money 
for his defense. <laughs> and he was able, so he, Eccles plays the game. Mm-hmm. He knows how. He's good at that. And what happened at the end of the game, you know, now you got Johnny Depp, who himself is, you know, notoriously involved in all levels of the occult. He's, right. you know, testified to that. So the narrative got rewritten. And so I started to realize that how they were able to change and move everything. And this is, I'm going to try to make this as brief as possible because I don't want to get off topic. But I found out from a friend of mine that works in the high tech community. I mean, he's top of the food chain as far as internet stuff. Explain to me how, let's say, uh, Joe Smith is running for Congress. And, you know, Steve, whatever, it wants to run against him. So what he does is he hires Internet people and pays them $250,000 or something to create websites that are going to supposedly allege that this guy has done all sorts of things that he hasn't done. And so by the time, you know, a Joe Smith, who's just, you know, innocent about these things, realizes what's happening Then when people get on the Internet, they've already, when they type his name in, already have a dozen or more created websites to support stuff that isn't even true. But people will accept it because that's, well, you know, Snopes says so. Right, right. You know, the first 15 websites say that this guy is a fraud, so it must be true. Mm -hmm. So I believe, and this is theory. That those who really run the real networks, I'm not talking. I'm talking about way above, you know, you know, the dabble or whatever. They have invested a lot of money in make sure that this narrative is sealed up and closed, and it was all satanic panic. And I think they succeeded. So there's a vested interest there. I've done done a little research on this, um, but I'm certainly not a, an expert. Uh, there are some cases out there that are just so over the top when it comes to um, the, the fingerprints, if you will, that that's hard to reach any other conclusion. Uh, the West Memphis Three is one. Um, the, uh, the the case of uh, oh Mark Dutro in uh, in Belgium and his his pedophile network there. Um, uh, pedophile networks that uh, have have been exposed. Uh, in the U.S. and and uh, uh, and Europe uh, over the past uh, 30, 40 years, uh, the, the Finders case that was tied to the CIA, uh, the disappearance of uh, of uh, Johnny Gosh, uh, you know, within the last twenty years, just a, a lot of things out there that just don't make any sense unless you consider the supernatural aspect. But what's really creepy is then when you realize that these cases, uh, what was any other case? The uh, the the priest in, in Toledo, uh, was it uh, Robinson? I believe so. Uh, some years back, who on um, who who murdered a nun was convicted of murdering a nun in a in a in a hospital uh, chapel, um, and doing it in a, in a ritual way, and yet these cases don't make it to the the, the into the public consciousness. Uh, when, well, worse than that, this is the worst part, is they've actually gone through, combed through the Internet, and they have rewritten every one of those things to prove that they were not what we said they were. <laughs> How do you fight against that? And this is part of my frustration. I know, ultimately, uh, my pastor always says, God doesn't always pay on Fridays. So, you know, I know, ultimately, as as one theologian said, the wheels of God grind um, slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. So I know eventually there will be payback for those who think they got away with these things. Mm-hmm. Um, it is personal to me because, for example, with the West Memphis, I I saw, <clears throat> forgive me, I saw the crime scene photos. Hmm. I know what I saw. And I can never get those pictures out of my head because these are little children. Mm-hmm. I have been so personally involved in these cases, and to see them rewritten one after the other is just horrifying to me. I mean, I don't want people to be focused, because I know, as Christians, we have to know that in the end, God is still in control. But as I tell people over and over again, whether it's a Johnny Gosh case, which I was on the periphery of, or some of these other cases, that we, we have to understand that the, the, the scriptures say, He has shown you, O man, what is good, what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to do justly, and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So we cannot turn away from these things and say they're not 
real because they are happening. And so it all comes down to how do we how do we battle these things? How do we fight these things? Well, that's that's the question, and maybe that's the direction we should go for the rest of this conversation because uh, I, I think for most of us in the church, this is sort of who are, are soaking in the, the culture around us, with government schools and, and media that's that's controlled. So we we reach adulthood convinced that this stuff is made up, that uh, only delusional people will will blame anything on on evil spirits uh even though the bible says you know that uh we're not dealing with human opponents i mean paul couldn't have been more clear principalities powers etc cetera, etc cetera. we we don't teach that in church the research bears it out barna group research pew research center shows that uh, the majority of american christians don't believe satan is real don't believe the holy spirit is real don't uh, and and a majority of american christians hold at least one of uh, i think they only asked about four different beliefs that come straight out of the new age which is uh, paganism it's a cult and yet 60% of american christians hold at least one of those beliefs we we are so spiritually dumbed down in in the western church that we don't grasp the nature of the war in which we've been deployed so what what do we do about it and i guess the follow-up question then is how do we approach it without being so terrified or depressed (laughs) that the world around us isn't what we thought it was well and that's the that's the whole thing is you know my my i've had learn how to stay underneath people's pain threshold to some degree. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything we talked about tonight is literally tip of the iceberg. And uh, honestly, you know, because there's, I'm going to tell you, there's a group that is getting reorganized of uh, people that are, you know, legal Satanists of the church, of Anton LaVey sort, or like the Satanic Temple, whatever. And they're getting organized against Christians who have anything to say about the devil or about Satan or whatever. That's fine. That's a different world for me. Uh, but they're also getting organized with lawyers and atheists and people to specifically target people like myself to make me come out and say, well, give us your proof. Hmm. You know, prove to us it's not satanic panic. And I'm here to say in front of you and our Lord and everybody, I have no intention. Of pr- I don't have to prove this to anyone uh, because it's already a life that I've lived in the middle of, and they're not interested in learning the truth. So how do we approach Christians on this? I think we need to, we're dealing with a time right now, I don't think it's a surprise to you or anybody that's got their eyes open, that the church is kind of teetering on the apostasy right now, where this generation of youth is so biblically ignorant, that's not a criticism because it's our fault. Right. Right. But they're so biblically inner, ignorant that you actually have major church teachers uh, right now saying things, for example, that we need to have, well, we've got the New Testament and the obsolete Testament, and we know it's full of flaws, and we know that there's a lot of inaccuracies, so let's not even bother with the Bible. These are major evangelical leaders. So my thoughts are two things. First of all, the war hasn't gone away, and the war is against powers and principalities. I don't know that we can turn the tide of biblical prophecy. What we can do is hold back the darkness, because what we're called to do as believers is to preach the gospel while we can with everything we've got. But you cannot war effectively in this age unless you understand spiritual warfare which, like you say, it's not being taught in any, uh, in just in a few of the churches now it's being taught. Most Christians don't believe in the devil. They don't believe in demons. I'm from the A.W. Tozer School of Theology. I believe in the devil because I've dealt with him. Hmm. And and there are there's more and more of a need as this society becomes more demonized, as you see people like Antifa just losing their minds. Right. And people on the streets just losing their minds for no reason, that this is social demonization. And believers need to understand, first of all, that we don't need to fear the devil or any of his powers or principalities, because a child with the name of Jesus Christ can send a flight of demons uh, out of the presence of God. Um, So we need to have that, to know that we have the victory, not just that, but the armor is given us. Not as decoration, but because the war is still on. And so what's the war for? It's to go out and redeem those that don't know Jesus Christ and to confront the evil 
wherever we can. If we cannot do that much as believers, um, then we've already seceded to the fight and said, well, it's over. We can't do that. We have to be proactive in this. And more than anything else, my desire for the rest of my life, as God gives me the grace, is to try and raise up a generation of young people who pick up the Bible and to put it in their hands and say, we're going to war for this generation and nothing's going to stop us. So as a youth pastor then, and your ministry, Youth Fire Ministries, has that been your focus? I mean, is this essentially what you're doing, is trying to train up a generation of kids who understand that uh, the war, that, they've, that they're in the middle of a war, and yet they have uh, been given all the weaponry that they need? That's been a big part of it. And as a youth pastor for many years in uh, one church and then another, uh, trying to carry out that mandate, and now just as a nonprofit uh, ministry with a, you know, a Monday night house church, that still is the goal in my heart. That's still my heart's cry is to raise up a generation of youth, because what I'm hearing now is two things. One is that youth ministry is flatlining all across the country. Kids aren't coming anymore because we've got nothing to offer them. Because what we offer them is games and Xboxes and all of that, and that lasts for about 2.5 seconds, and they can go get entertained better somewhere else. And the other thing I hear from a lot of church leaders is, well, kids can't handle this level of spiritual warfare. (laughs) Don't you kid yourself. They are more capable of handling spiritual warfare than about 95% of the adults that I know. And if God has to pass by those of us who should have trained them and didn't so that this battle goes to this last generation, so be it. We need to invest in this generation while we still can and raise them up. Now, how do we do that? I mean, that, that's that's the big question here. I've, I've got a friend back in Illinois who uh, was a, a youth leader and was given the left foot of fellowship by his church when he dared speak out against uh, the occult origins, the pagan origins of yoga. And, uh, right. yeah, that got back to the lady who taught yoga in the church, and uh, then they were looking for a new church home. Um, so... <laughs> That's typical. Yeah, Yeah, that's typical. Uh, It it shouldn't surprise people to believe people like some of the greatest church leaders. I can't remember exactly when, if it was uh, Jonathan Edwards, but it was somebody uh, one bit way back in the day. I I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was at least a century and a half ago that actually was working with the youth in his church. And he exposed the fact that young boys were looking at clothes catalog for sexual purposes Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all the way back then. And he exposed it and they fired him. So it's nothing new because Here's the thing about youth is 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 youth bring parental tithes. And if somebody is ruffling the water and making their kids think about, I mean, it's a, it's a terrible thing if you've got a kid comes into your youth group and mom and dad are looking at pornography openly or are, you know, whatever, and you're teaching the truth about what the Word of God says about these things. I'm just being honest with you, friend. Uh, they're going to give this youth pastor a left foot of fellowship mm-hmm. because they're hurting the financial. Uh, I'm not trying to be cynical. I'm just telling you based on experience. They don't want the financial uh, resources to get ruffled. And so they call for more games and they say kids aren't being able to be exposed to that much truth. As all the years I've done youth ministry, which is really since I was 16 years old, and that's back when I rode dinosaurs to church, I can tell you just (laughs) flat out that they're able to give you as much as you give them if you give them, first of all, purpose. Secondly, if you give them the truth of the Word of God. If they do not have the truth of the Word of God, they have no power over the darkness that's coming. I don't care how much they want to be. The seven sons of Siva saying, Mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, hey, if you don't know Jesus and know his Word, you got nothing. But if you have those things, I don't care if they're 17, 18, 19 years old, they're going to do some serious damage to the enemy, and that's what we want. And that's why the enemy's put so much effort into uh, trying to get them derailed early on. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, in some senses, I feel like based on what I've seen on a national stand view, I think the enemy thinks he's pretty much won this generation over. I really do. Because what's contesting him, really? What do we have to offer? And that's why I need, I'm quoting my old buddy Mario Murillo, we need to sue the devil for custody of this generation while we can. We need to take him back. 
what do you do to, to get their attention, to hold them, and, and to teach them good theology? I give them the Word of God, straight hmm. up. Hmm. I'll do topical stuff every once. I'm no longer a formal youth pastor in a church for a number of reasons, um, but I give them the straight up Word of God. Sometimes we'll talk, talk, talk topically. Uh, when we have our, our, our meetings, we, have, we give them worship. Um, time of worship, and then we pray for each other. You know, we spend a lot of time drinking coffee and just sharing on a fellowship level. But it's just straight up word of God because they're they don't. That's what builds them up. That's what makes them strong. Hmm. And it hasn't worked because it hasn't been tried. <laughs> well, it seems to me, you know, and, and this is one of the things that that I has has really hit me as I research this stuff about uh, you know the, the the Greek gods and, and Roman mythology and and the uh, the gods of the ancient world, the Egyptian gods. Is that if I had understood when I was twelve that these things were real, that God wasn't just speaking metaphorically when He said, "On this night, I will execute judgments on all the gods of Egypt." I mean, He really meant it. Yes. And that the parting of the Red Sea was specifically directed at one particular entity, and that the uh, the attack on Jericho was because it was a center of moon god worship. The the uh, uh, you know the, the the last night of Babylon before it fell to the Medes and Persians was was tied to the timing of the the fall festival direct you know, for 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 the moon god. You know this stuff was all real. And yet, you know, for us, it was always at the level of little cartoon figures on a flannel board. So by the time yeah, you get old, the problem, yeah. yeah, when you when you get old enough to think, oh, okay, that that stuff's silly. That's that stuff's for kids. If if I had known this stuff when I was twelve, church would have been cool. I would have been excited to go back every Sunday morning. Well, and we had that in some in some forms. I think that's why we were actually getting a lot of kids saved back in the eighties. Because as much as people want to make fun of it now, when you had like. You know, Carmen doing the big stage show with Fighting the Devil. I thought that was pretty cool myself. It was mm-hmm. interesting. The kids thought it was great, but they were all like, they were all like, where do we sign up for the war? Tell us how to fight. Mm-hmm. They wanted to know. And you had groups like Fire by Night that were just like, you know, and other groups that were like, they were willing to do the work. They were willing to do the work of training the kids. Um, you know, some of them are still fighting. Some of them fell away. That's typical of any church setting. But they gave them... See, here's the deal, I believe with all my heart. Everybody's so worried about making the gospel relevant. Forget about that. If it's real, it'll be relevant. If you tell kids the truth unvarnished, they're going to respect you and they're going to listen. They know when they're being scammed. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they know when you say, hey, come to the meeting because we've got you know really cool games and stuff. And they get there and they're like, you lied to me. This is church. <laughs> yeah. Well, give them the truth, and then they won't be. They won't feel like they've been scammed. Mm-hmm. And maybe, maybe God will raise up a Jonathan Edwards, or God will raise up another Billy Graham. But we need to tell them the truth. Hmm. And real is more important than relevant. I love that. Real is more important than relevant. Dr. Gregory Reed, his ministry is Youth Fire Ministries, your website, GregoryReed.com. Where, where do people go, I mean, uh, to, to follow your work? Is that the best place? And, and how would they go about supporting you in, in your, your ministry? Well, they can just hop on the website. I've got a lot of resources there, and there's a lot of articles that I've written. And you have to comb through. There's some audio messages. Um, also on Facebook. Um, you can find me pretty easily, and I'm always rattling the cages there on Facebook. So, um, And just however they want to support in prayer, whatever else is greatly appreciated. I do encourage them if they can. I'm not trying to sell books for a living at all, but I think the books are there. I think they're extraordinarily valuable, not because I've written them, but because I prayed through every book that I wrote. Um, the book on spiritual warfare, I think, is extraordinarily important in this hour. No, amen to that. There's uh, not enough instruction out there on that particular topic. And uh, uh, folks, uh, if you've not heard Greg's uh, testimony, uh, just, you know, I, I did down in, in Lubbock to, to a degree. And uh, this is somebody who's been through the wars. So, uh, Greg, I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to talk with us. And uh, I'm hoping that we can... Uh, see each other in the flesh again but uh, you know as the the old saying goes here there in the air but uh, Amen. We, we definitely God bless you thanks for having me on Dr. Greg Reed's website gregoryreed.com that's r e i d gregoryreed.com the books he mentioned war of the ages which is a guide to spiritual warfare trojan church which is how uh, 
another book about how the uh, New Age movement has moved into and invaded the church. And uh, Nobody's Angel, which is his story. You'll find all of those at GregoryReed.com. Coming up in our final segment tonight, a couple more things in the news to discuss. Um, Yeah, another Ebola scare, this time uh, in Europe. Earth's magnetic field is weakening. The Dead Sea, ironically enough, is dying. And more... Oh yeah, and you'll never you'll never guess why the city of Portland, Oregon is being accused the reason that the city of Portland, Oregon is being accused of putting signs, warning signs on old buildings there to warn against a future earthquake. That and more as a view from the bunker continues. I'm Derek Gilbert. The Ripper's dark deeds actually began long before 1888. And it wasn't a mere man who committed the crimes, but a demon in league with devilish men, a group of men called Red Wing. Only one small group of valiant men and women stand against this evil, a group that place their faith in Christ alone. And they protect a secret, a secret of blood that Red Wing hopes to use to usher in the reign of Antichrist and the end of day. Red Wing is called Red Wing because they want to kill the church. They want to forever stop Christ from coming back. So it's the Holy Spirit the dove Mm -hmm. with a murdered uh, has been slain, a wounded Mm. dove. Ultimately, we still have to remember that the one who is in control is God Almighty, and we have to go to him, and we have to suit up every time we go out. The Red Wing Saga by Sharon K. Gilbert. Book 1. Blood Lies. Book 2. Blood Rights. Book 3. The Blood is the Life. Book 4. Realms of Stone. And coming soon, Book 5. Realms of Fire. Available at skywatchtvstore.com, and paperback and Kindle at amazon.com. Characters you'll love, and a story you can't put down. The Red Wing Saga by Sharon K. Gilbert. A new take on the prophesied war of Gog and Magog. Forget about Russia coming from the uttermost parts of the north. The enemy foreseen by the prophet Ezekiel is so much bigger and so much older. It's Last Clash of the Titans by Derek P. Gilbert, a number one new release in Amazon's Christian history category. Last Clash of the Titans breaks down step by step how Greek mythology grew out of Canaanite religion, why the old gods of the Greeks, the Titans, were the watchers who descended on the summit of Mount Hermon, and why the Titans will return from the abyss for one final battle against God, Armageddon. Last Clash of the Titans, backed up by peer-reviewed academic research. Tom Horn calls this book stunning. Last Clash of the Titans, the second coming of Hercules, Leviathan, and the prophesied war between Jesus Christ and the gods of antiquity. Get it as part of a special offer at skywatchtvstore.com and available now in paperback and as a Kindle ebook at amazon.com. Talk in the Walk every Sunday night. This is A View from the Bunker Live. I'm Derek Gilbert. Next Sunday night, our guest has authored a book that will make you think. You may not agree with him, but uh, it will make you think. Freeing the Word of God from the Bible. Can we or even should we? Keith Giles, the book Jesus Unbound, Liberating the Word of God from the Bible. He's our guest next Sunday night. That's January 13th here on VFTB Live. Thank you for listening tonight, whether it's at vftb.net. You've also got the uh, View from the Bunker player uh, at my website. That's derekpgilbert.com, and you can log in listen there. Spreaker.com, and of course, there's the chat room at spreaker.com if you listen there. So you can join the conversation, and of course, you can join us via the archives by subscribing to the podcast, and you'll find links on the various ways to do that at vftb.net. Some breaking news this Sunday night, January 6th, from uh, Israel. Rocket sirens in Ashkelon, that's in uh, southern Israel, This uh, just about 30 minutes ago. As rockets have been fired from Hamas positions in the Gaza Strip, uh, just hours after the uh, Is- Israel Defense Force hit two Hamas positions, in response to an explosive device that was fired into or flown into southern Israel earlier in the day, Sunday. So early Monday morning in Israel and the rocket sirens are going off there. The uh, 
rocket fired by Hamas into southern Israel was intercepted by the Iron Dome anti-missile system. So again, folks in uh, southern Israel, the uh, city of Ashkelon there, uh, taking cover this morning as uh, Hamas trying to fire back at Israel. Uh, Earlier in the day on Sunday, an explosive device launched into uh, Israel with a large attached to a large cluster of balloons and a drone like glider. It landed in a carrot field in southern in the southern uh, Negev, well, not the southern Negev, but in the Negev, which is in southern Israel. Uh, this was shortly before noon Sunday. And again, in response to that, the IDF hit a couple of Hamas positions and uh, responding to the response, Hamas firing a missile. But again, apparently the Iron Dome system has intercepted it. Um, business as usual. Business as usual in Israel. I have no doubt that um, that will be the case as uh, the business day begins there on Monday. While we were there in May, we uh, heard early, early one morning the sound of, um, I believe they were F-15s flying overhead, heading north towards uh, the Syrian border to launch a strike, a preemptive strike against some uh, Iranian positions inside Syria. And uh, we had been prevented, stopped from uh, going to a couple of sites, or one site that we wanted to see, uh, in the Golan Heights, and that was Mount Bental. We were told that from Mount Bental, on, you, you can see from the uh, observation point up there, Damascus, which really drives home the point that Israel is really a small place surrounded by people who don't like it very much, which is why, as I mentioned in the first segment tonight, Israel intends to hang on to the Golan Heights and is asking the United States to recognize its sovereignty over the Golan. Because strategically speaking, giving up the Golan would be like allowing an enemy to put a knife to the country's throat. So, a couple of other things to talk about before we close out for this week. Um, I, I... Don't often fixate on stories like this because a lot of times the science is just not right and the claims are blown out of proportion. And I confess, I don't really understand the science behind this, but it is reported from at sciencealert.com and uh, citing work from uh, researchers on something called the South Atlantic anomaly. And in a nutshell, in a nutshell, the Earth's magnetic field is weakening and apparently it's weakening because of an anomaly underneath the south the south atlantic ocean apparently this pattern of disruption caused by this anomaly this disruption to the magnetic field has been going on for about a thousand years now the scientists admit they don't know if a uh, a pole flip north pole and south pole reversing positions is uh, going to happen anytime soon but they also admit that they don't they don't have a whole lot of hard data There's not a lot of historical data that they can uh, use to determine whether or not something like this is going to happen. They've got some data, uh, specifically from the Bantu people of Africa. They live in the uh, border zone between Zimbabwe and Botswana. And apparently, a thousand years ago, when uh, the crops weren't doing well, they would have a ritual in which they would burn their clay huts and grain bins down as a cleansing ritual. And when you do that, apparently that freezes the... um, orientation of the magnetic field into the clay that's uh, fired. And so scientists have been looking at that for clues as to the orientation and the strength of the magnetic field over the last thousand years. And they've concluded that uh, it appears that fluctuations in the magnetic field caused by this anomaly that stretches from South America to Africa uh, has strengthened between the years 400 and 450 A.D., 700 and 750 A.D., and between about 1225 and 1550. But what that means, they don't know. So, uh, leave it in God's hands. I don't know that there's anything we could do about it anyway. Uh, The Dead Sea, the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, speaking of Israel. And by the way, don't forget, uh, still time for you to uh, reserve your place on the Skywatch TV tour of Israel coming up in May. Um, and getting across the Jordan River into Jordan and seeing the, uh, well, what Moses saw from Mount Nebo, but then going to Petra will also be pretty incredible. I uh, have been doing some research on Petra here the last week or so and found that that's a lot more relevant to what is going on in the world today 
than uh, I realized from a supernatural, spiritual perspective, that is. Anyway, um, we talked last week about the uh, deal reached by the governments of Israel and Jordan to dig a channel from the Red Sea up to the Dead Sea. The purpose being to supply fresh water after desalination to the country of Jordan, which is one of the most water poor countries on earth, and then to pump the brine, the real salty water, back into the Dead Sea, which is essentially what the Dead Sea is anyway. But they got to hurry on this because they don't, I don't think it is going to be completed until 2022, if I remember the story. But uh, experts say that because of the water, it's being pulled out of the area, the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River. Uh, And the Dead Sea, which is being uh, essentially mined, there are companies, factories along the shore of the Dead Sea that are evaporating the water and taking the minerals out and causing the Dead Sea to drop by about uh, five feet a year. So by the middle of the century, by 2050, the uh, Dead Sea may be reduced to a tiny pool unless Israel and Jordan can work together and dig this channel to uh, essentially let the Red Sea drain northward into the Red Sea. So while they're working on that, um, as we're looking around at uh, odd earth changes as possible signs for things that are happening around the world, uh, a couple of rivers in diverse places turned blood red this past week. One in Malawi, the Lintepe River in Malawi, on Wednesday turned blood red. Women from a village went down to wash their clothing in the river as they normally do, and uh, oops, river like blood. Locals uh, not ruling out divine uh, intervention, but uh, authorities are looking at uh, some sort of chemical dump into the water that may have caused it. Meanwhile, a similar thing took place in the capital and largest city of Papua New Guinea. This is in Indonesia. Small river there turned bright red. So those who look for um, prophetic signs in the headlines, obviously paying very close attention to this. Again, also likely that uh, there are people who are illegally dumping chemicals into the water, causing uh, causing those changes. Um, This this is a story that we've been tracking. Sharon has been watching this for some time. In fact, four years ago, you might recall, uh, she authored a book called Ebola and the Fourth Horseman of the Apocalypse. This was one of the first books that uh, was published as uh, we were relocating from Illinois here to the Ozarks to uh, partner with Skywatch TV. And uh, Sharon explained how the uh, outbreak of Ebola or a pathogen, a, a communicable disease, a, a pandemic like Ebola might actually be the fulfillment of the um, the rider on the pale horse. That uh, one of the uh, Greek terms used to describe the uh, the means by which the rider on the pale horse, death, Thanatos, uh, would be Therion. And, uh, the, you know, she, she explains it a lot better than I did. She did a presentation on this at the Prophecy Conference in Orlando back in 2014 and had people with their jaws on the floor. But anyway, that led to the book Ebola and the Fourth Horseman of the, the Apocalypse, which thankfully, thankfully, uh, the uh, 2014 Ebola outbreak in Western Africa burned out shortly after the book was published. Sadly, it appears now that it's becoming more relevant once again. The number of cases in the Central African nation of Congo has now crossed 600 with 322 confirmed deaths. That is a very lethal virus. Again, more than 50% mortality rate in this current outbreak of Ebola. There is a gentleman who's being watched at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. He's in quarantine there. He's not showing any symptoms but uh, officials there are watching him because he was working as a, a health worker in Congo, and they want to make sure that uh, he doesn't come into contact with anyone before they can rule out Ebola uh, completely. And what they're learning, or what they've learned since 2014, they've learned some things about that disease that they didn't know before. It was taken as sort of a given that you had to be exposed to fluids from a victim of the disease, 
in order to uh, basically come into physical contact with blood or something from a victim to catch the disease. And it turned out that that's not quite the case, that uh, someone with the disease could essentially aerosolize the the virus by sneezing. And um, then you would not actually have to touch a victim in order to pick up the virus. And it only takes a few virus particles to contract Ebola. Now they know that uh, not everybody who carries the disease is symptomatic. Case in point, the gentleman in Nebraska, who may not, in fact, be infected. They're watching him as a precaution because he may have been exposed to it. But there are others who they have found who have spread the disease without showing symptoms. And some who have spread the disease after they recovered. And it was assumed that they were healthy again. And, oddly enough, spread through sexual contact, husbands and wives. So, uh, this now is a uh, concern in Sweden, as a man who was vomiting blood was admitted to a hospital late last week after visiting the African country, country of Burundi for three weeks. He was admitted to a uh, hospital in the town of Enkoping in Sweden and then transferred to Uppsala University Hospital Um Now, late Friday night, they came back and said the tests for the Ebola virus were negative, so he is not, in fact, a a victim of Ebola. But again, it just points up the um, situation we're in in this modern world in which air travel, international air travel, is so available that all it takes is one person getting on an international flight at an airport before he or she shows symptoms. And suddenly, everyone at the airport on that flight, but also in the terminal, potentially exposed to a disease with a 50% mortality rate. So, sadly, this is nothing we take uh, any pleasure in whatsoever, but uh, it appears that Sharon's 2014 book, Ebola and the Fourth Horseman of the Apocalypse, is once again becoming relevant. Uh, And again, in Congo, the Ebola total now over 600 and what's making things worse is the uh, rebellion in northern Congo. Healthcare workers who are trying to work in the areas where the uh, disease is spreading, trying to contain it, are, are being attacked. Partly because the people don't trust them, but also because uh, the rebels are, are wanting to hold them for ransom. It's a way to raise funds to buy more weapons and supplies. I said 322. I was mistaken. The most recent count, according to SIDRAP, which is the Center for uh, Infectious Disease up at the University of Minnesota, uh, they've got the fatality count at 368. So 368, the current fatality count as of this Sunday night. Samaritan's Purse, Samaritan's Purse, which is Franklin Graham's ministry, which um, sent workers to uh, treat Ebola patients in the West African outbreak four years ago, plans to open an Ebola treatment center in Congo. So pray for their safety. Oxfam, meanwhile, has announced they are suspending activities because of the violence. So where uh, some fear to tread, Samaritan's Purse is going in. (laughs) Uh, God bless them. Because they're going to need his divine protection. Uh, Not just from the disease, but again, because of the uh, violence in uh, Congo. Uh, Elections that were scheduled there have been postponed. In fact, uh, over the weekend, President Trump told House Speaker Nancy Pelosi that 80 American military personnel and appropriate combat equipment are being deployed to Central Africa. They're going to be uh, sent to Gabon, which is a neighboring country to Congo. Their mission is to secure U.S. citizens and diplomatic facilities in Congo in the event that the violent demonstrations there uh, spread and threaten the lives of Americans. So, a Samaritan's Purse going, and we've got some soldiers that are heading to that uh, area as well. And finally tonight, we report on uh, a story from Portland, Oregon, which just is one of those things that just makes you shake your head. It's like, why, why how this, this would even threat, you know, c- come into anyone's mind is beyond my comprehension. I mean, I, I guess I just don't 
don't think this way. Looking, look, well, anyway, I, I'm trying to be kind in the way I phrase this because I, I don't walk in the shoes of the people who are making these complaints. What are they complaining about? Well, a new city policy in Portland, Oregon requires public signs on brick buildings, brick buildings, warning that they might collapse in an earthquake. However, the local chapter of the uh, NAACP is complaining and is accusing the city government of posting these signs because it's part of a long history of white supremacy aimed at forcing black people to move out of neighborhoods. Um, the policy affects about 1,600 unreinforced masonry buildings, brick buildings, that are on average about 90 years old. And many of them, being older, are in neighborhoods that are predominantly African-American. This according to the report in the Oregonian newspaper. But according to the NAACP, and I quote, the policy exacerbates a long history of systemic and structural betrayals of trust and policies of displacement, demolition, and dispossession predicated on classism, racism, and white supremacy, end quote. Now, no doubt there are events and policies that could be identified in the history of most major cities in America, in which classism, racism, And, yes, white supremacy played a role. But bear in mind that experts say that Portland, Oregon, is at risk because there is a near 50% chance of a giant earthquake along the Cascadia subduction zone off the Oregon coast sometime in the next 50 years. This could cause a tsunami of devastating proportions along the coast of Oregon, which could affect the city of Portland. Bear in mind also that brick doesn't flex. When ground moves beneath a brick building, brick tends to shatter, meaning that the structural integrity of those brick buildings is severely compromised. The people living in those brick buildings would be at severe risk of injury or death. The NAACP sees this as Racism and classism and white supremacy. Well, this ordinance was adopted in October, approved in October, went into effect. They say it's part of an effort to aim uh, to upgrade old buildings to withstand an earthquake. Now, no question, this is costly. The people who own these buildings, again, mainly older, mainly in lower income neighborhoods. And the cost of bringing these buildings up to code would run into the millions of dollars. But what do you do? You live in an area where experts say there's a 50% chance of a devastating earthquake sometime in the next 50 years. Some of us might still be around to see that devastating earthquake quake along the north, you know, in, in northwestern America. It um, seems to me that prudence, what's the, what's the phrase I'm looking for? It's getting toward the end of the program and the blood sugar is beginning to drop. Uh, uh, well, uh, the better part of valor. Discretion, the better part of valor. If the government didn't do anything, just, you, you could, well, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to uh, could, just imagine the number of lawsuits. Anyway, for some people, uh, identity politics colors Everything, even something like this, an opportunity, an op, a, 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 an effort to try to um, preserve the lives of citizens in Portland, Oregon. Again, the mind reels when you look at this. Well, a lot going on in 2019. We hope and pray that this will be a blessed, healthy, and profitable year for you and your family. Hopefully we can see you at one of these stops along the way during this year. The Hear the Watchman Conference, March 28th through 31st in Dallas. We can save you $20 on the registration. Just use the promo code GILBERT20, that's GILBERT20, 
at hearthewatchmen.com. Hey, Skywatch TV, hosting its first ever conference, the Defender Conference, coming to Branson, Missouri, August 2nd through 4th. Speakers include Tom Horn, Mike Heiser, Pastor Carl Gallops, Dr. Michael Lake, Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, Sharon and me, of course, Josh Peck, the Fall Brothers, Donna Howell, Allie Anderson, Joe Horn, and more. And music by special guest Dino Kartsanakis. For more information, log on to DefenderConference.com. That's DefenderConference.com. And don't wait, because that one is going to fill up quickly. Please leave a review of this program at Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or wherever else you find us. Give us a like at Facebook. And remember, View from the Bunkers, a production of Gilbert House, released under Creative Commons Attribution, Non-Commercial, No Derivatives, 4.0 International License. The opening theme by Kevin McLeod, Incompetech.com. Our announcer, DC Good. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is a View from the Bunker.